It's the Mustang Insider Show. All right, it's Mustang Insider talking all things Cal Poly Athletics as we reflect and put the finishing touches on the 22-23 athletic year. Look ahead to the summer. It's going to go by quickly. We're going to be back with fall sports, men's, women's soccer, volleyball, football, among others, before you know it. Don Oberhelman, Cal Poly Director of Athletics, our guest. Don, appreciate you taking some uh, time to join us. Hey, b before you start to look ahead and before we look back on the year that was, what's on your summer schedule? Because there's no events for your athletic teams until mid to late August. Yeah, it's a lot of recruiting goes on in the summer. Obviously, we get a lot of next year's recruits coming in on, on unofficial visits. You know, the camps are never ending these days, it seems, uh, the prospect camps. Um, so while the campus kind of can shut down, I think, uh, certain areas, we just really don't do that anymore. More and more of these sports are year round. I don't think that's a great thing, but it, it, it just kind of is what it is with the practice rules and everything. So, you know, our basketball team will be here. Our football team will be here. Our golf teams will be here, you know, when they're not. Uh, at home doing something else, they're going to be here working out. So for us, our sports medicine facility is full, our weight room's full, uh, our fields are full. We got a lot of stuff going on. So, um, it, it, and then obviously just heavy into the planning for what next fall is going to look like with the marketing plans and the ticketing plans and all of those things. So uh, I'd like to say we get to just kind of check out for three months like a lot of educators get to do but that doesn't work in the in the realm of division one athletics for sure well i i, I definitely do want to do some looking ahead because i i genuinely believe there are some really good times ahead here for a lot of these programs that are have been trying to turn the corner and, and get to the, their top of the, the standings respectively wherever they might be be shuffled but as you reflect on the year that was in cal poly athletics i, I can't help but uh start to think about what we've seen in recent weeks from Aiden McCarthy, uh, a Cal Poly track and field first team All-American. I mean, he absolutely lit it up at the NCAA regionals, uh, really made made a great representation of Cal Poly. And I think of uh, all the steps forward that the wrestling program took, winning the Pac-12 regular season title this year. Uh, women's golf had a terrific run, among others. As you look back at the year that was, Cal Poly, they, they finished fourth in this year's Big West Commissioner's Cup, ahead of Santa Barbara, ahead of Hawaii, ahead of Davis, among others. What programs impressed you the most this past year? And, and what programs do you think are on the cusp of turning that corner and, and really competing for, for championships as soon as this next year? Yeah, I, I probably got to start with... Uh... Um, the most impressive performances I think this year were just wrestling, just did a phenomenal job track and field. Um, I mean, I can't say enough about this coaching staff and what, what they've been able to do. Um, they, they do not have a lot of their own. They have not been able to hit the recruiting trail as hard as they would have liked in year one. Um, but they made a lot of our existing talent a lot better. Um, and their entire, their times improved. I mean, it's kind of funny in a sport like that, you can't, you're not vaguely seeing somebody improved. You can look at the stopwatch and know what that improvement was. You can look at how far they threw the shot put, discus, et cetera. It's very measurable, those results. Um, so Aiden McCarthy just, uh, just hit it out of the park. That kid bought into everything the coaches were selling, um, did everything they asked, and you, you see what happens there. Um, at one point, he had the second fastest time in the country. Uh, he kind of got caught on the outside on on uh, in in the finals there, and I, I sure would like to see him run that race again because uh, I do think he he could have been a little bit more competitive in that national championship race. Uh, I can't remember sixth, seventh, um, where he ultimately finished, but um, you know he 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 got caught, and that can happen in in those distance races like that. Um, you know, and across the board in track and field, I see some great things coming for them. Um, in terms of what wrestling did this year, winning the Pac-12 conference in terms of the uh, the regular season championship, um, you know, that's never happened to us uh, in our history in the Pac-12 here in wrestling. I think it's a testament to the dedication of the coaching staff, what John Cerritos has built and what he's done here is just added one step every single year. He has been climbing that ladder and building the culture the right way. So that's something that we've preached here from day one when we hire a new coach. 
you know, you, you don't need to bring in a bunch of transfers. You don't need to recruit the junior colleges. Let's recruit high school kids. Let's get our culture right. Let's talk about what the locker room's like. Let's talk about what practice is like. Um, and, and if you do that, the wins will come. We've seen them do it in tennis. I've uh, seen them do it in a lot of different sports here. Um, and, and, and I just, I see John Cerritos as being a great example of how he just got the culture uh, the way he wanted it, was able to just recruit a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better, develop talent just a little bit better. And uh, and now you see him with a top 25 program, and, and I don't see you as falling back anytime soon because of the way he's grown it, developed it, and, and built the thing from the foundation up. Do, do you see John Cerritos in the way he's been able to, to grow his program? And I, I know you mentioned recruiting a little bit better year by year. I mean, I, I think they were winless like his first year and mm -hmm. uh, not much more his second year. And then you kind of saw them turning the quarter a little bit that third year. And then, you know, from, from there on out, I mean, obviously, you know, he, he's departed since, but Bernie Truax had a terrific run here and, and the Lamer brothers um, among others that we've seen uh, wick as well. Uh, I know he's on the coaching staff now. So uh, is that, is that the recipe for success when a new coach comes in and takes over a program at Cal Poly? I mean, uh, you see other other programs and maybe it's not fair to compare, you know, Cal Poly to, to other schools in the big West. Certainly the academic standards are a big part of that, but I mean, how long does a rebuild at a pro a school like Cal Poly, regardless of the program, how long in your mind does that take? Like how patient are you when a new head coach comes in here, takes over a program that, that might be struggling, might be towards the bottom of the standings in, in your mind, what, what does that clock look like? Like forget the contract. Like what is, what does that look like? Like realistically, how long does it take? Because for John Cerritos, it took a good five, six years. You had to be patient there. And now you're really seeing how that's paid off for the wrestling program. Yeah, I, I think you answered your question right off the bat with it. It, it, it is going to depend on the program, obviously. So um, I think John Cerritos inherited a program that we we were, uh, I think it's, it's safe to say we were floundering. And he really needed to start over for a sport like women's basketball. Uh, I don't think Chanel is necessarily starting over from a culture standpoint. Uh, she may be starting over from a talent standpoint a little bit. But it, it, it's two very different situations that they inherited where um, it is the one th thing that we did exceptionally well with women's basketball for a long, long time is the, the tremendous camaraderie and culture within that locker room. Um, so she's got a slightly different build than that trying to maintain that culture and bring in just more talent that we can develop. Whereas I think John was really having to start from scratch. So yeah, the, the, the clock looks a little bit different, but um, I think I made it clear from the get go with all of these coaches and I'm not somebody that's going to put, um, you know, a, a time frame on success. We're just not going to put a clock to it. Um, if we are continuing to make progress like John has a little bit better year after year, you know, would we have liked to have been top 25 after year two? Yeah, but I'll bet if we were, we'd have dropped right back down. We'd have plummeted right back out because it would have been two transfers that would have got us there. And I just feel deeply the way to do this thing is is build it for the long term and build it for sustained success instead of get you know one and done, two and done kind of kind of student athletes. Can we use those? Sure. Can they help us here and there? Sure. But uh, I think our bread and butter at Cal Poly is always going to be those 4.0 freshmen, uh, talented student athletes coming in that that want to be coached, that are coachable, make good decisions. Uh, bring their lunch pail to work every day. And that's how you're going to do it is go find in those blue collar work ethic um, uh, student athletes. Cause to me, that's what Cal Poly is. You can go to another school and not have to work very hard in the classroom. Obviously everybody works very hard at their craft and their sport. Uh, this is a place you better, you better bring it every day, both in the classroom and on the field. And the type of kids that are successful here knew that goal. So we just continue to recruit those type of student athletes. And, and I think you'll see what track and field's doing with how they're going to recruit, what Chanel Styers is going to do uh, when she recruits. And I think you're going to see uh, exactly what I'm talking about. Don Oberhelman, Director of Athletics at Cal Poly, our guest here on Mustang Insider. You, you're coming up on a decade at Cal Poly. Is that right? Oh, no, I blew a decade by a long time ago. What, what was that, 12, 2012? I, I'm, I'm, in year th I'm in year 13 right you're in now. You're 13 now. It has it does it feel like 13 years? 
Uh, there's certain days it feels like a lot longer than that, I can tell you. But no, um, you know, this is such a passion project, this job. Um, it is, um, I, I, I tease the president every once in a while. I, I say, you know, you, you hired me to, to do a job and you pay me a good salary to do it. Uh, whereas I would have done it for free, but it's too late. I now have a contract, so you can, <laughs> no, no, no backseas. Um, you know, it's uh, th this job chews you, chews you up and spits you out. I'm by far the longest tenured athletic director in the Big West, by far the longest in the Big Sky. Um, from wrestling, I'm pretty sure I'm the longest in that group of the Pac-12. So um, you don't stay in these jobs long. A lot of people hop from job to job do three, four years and get out before, um, you know, the lob comes after them. And uh, I think in my case, I've got an amazing president where we are completely aligned. He is very, very happy here. Um, I'm very, very happy here. Our wives are very, very happy here. Um, I love our student athletes. I think we're doing good work here. Uh, I have no interest in, um, you know, another opportunity. And I don't think our president does either. And, um, why would I want to, 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 to do that when I've got such a good thing going on here? The grass isn't always greener. And I wish I could say that to some of the transfer students that, you know, are hopping from school to school to school to school. And it's like, I, I don't know what you're looking for. If you can't find it, then that probably says more about you than a geographic uh, uh, destination. We have found it here. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I'm a, I'm emboldened every day by talking to her. If I feel like I'm having a bad day, I open up my door and a student athlete will wander in. And after five minutes with whoever that student athlete is, my day all of a sudden has turned into a really, really good day. And that's one of the cool things about this job is not everybody gets to do that. Not, not everybody gets to say, I'm having a bad day. I'm going to flip it. I'm just going to open up my door and go talk to somebody. And um, it's usually a student athlete. Sometimes it can be a, a head or assistant coach that kind of wanders in and we get to talk about what their issues are, what's going on in the program, how can we help, uh, and how can we find solutions to um, to all of it, uh, whatever their issues might be. And and our social issues are non-existent for the most part. Our kids just tend, our student athletes make a lot better decisions than they have at any other school I've ever worked at. I can tell you that. To the point, their bad decisions aren't all that bad at the end of the day. Um, you know, there are decisions that they make that can get you kicked out of the family. We don't have those kind of decisions going on here. So uh, I love the social aspect of what we get to do. Um, I love the, the competitive nature of what we get to do. And what's not ever going to be lost on me is the fact that our coaches are among the best educators on this campus. So we also get to be teachers. So that makes this job so much more fun than anything else I could ever find to do. My goodness, 13 years. I can only imagine how much the, the college sports landscape has changed. And it's far from just conference realignment. It's the NCAA. It's uh, the power of the players and the ability to make money. And all that stuff has just completely changed since you took that seat as the director of athletics at Cal Poly. Speaking of changes, the Big West recently came out with a few of them. Uh, they are adding men's and women's swimming and diving. Uh, they also have introduced a baseball tournament. We knew that was on the way, but we got some specifics. It's going to be the top five teams from the regular season. Four plays five as a play-in game, and then they kind of go about it double elimination uh, with those four teams. Hopefully that helps, and I'll, I'll get your thoughts on uh, the RPI formula and, and how the West Coast seemingly got snubbed again this year, the Big West in particular. Uh, men's and women's basketball in the Big West tournament. That has shrunk down a little bit. It's put more importance on the regular season, down from 10 teams to eight teams. So kind of old school, pre-Bakersfield, pre-UC San Diego. You'd have the top eight teams go. The ninth team would get left out of the conference tournament. But now the top two seeds in men's and women's basketball for the Big West tournament will be escorted to the semifinal round. I mean, you have 20 Big West regular season games. So I, I kind of like how you, you have... Uh, some more importance behind those. What I don't like is, you know, you had a, a Cal Poly men's team this past year. They were the 10 seed. They they beat the life out of the seven seed, and they nearly knocked off the two seed that went on to to win the whole darn thing in UC Santa Barbara. So uh, that's disappointing, but certainly, obviously, the expectations uh, become a little bit higher for the regular season. I, I know I threw a lot at you just now with the swimming and diving and the baseball tournament and, and the changes with the basketball, but your your thoughts when you read all of that and, and you saw all of that become official? 
Yeah, so a lot of those things that we've been arguing and arguing may not be the right word, but discussing for, you know, two and three years now in terms of how the postseason is going to work for volleyball, softball, baseball, um, tweaks to the men's and women's soccer. I don't even remember what else. I mean, it's it's kind of become this whole deal where we used to not really believe in doing a conference tournament that we should let our top seed uh, for the right. How do you identify the best team is kind of the, the old um, question. And, you know, for me, it's always been the best team wins the regular season. That's your best team. Uh, is that the team always wins the tournament? No. Is that always the hottest team? No. Um, and then you got basketball, which is done completely different, which is everybody goes. And I've always kind of liked that. The basketball is treated just a little bit differently by the NCAA that, you know, to your point, you can start over. W- one of the commissioner's points, was, which I thought was really funny, <laughs> He said, uh, well, the reason we think only eight should go is no team's ever won our conference tournament lower than a five seed. I was like, um, <laughs> point of information. 2014. Um, yes. And I'll <laughs> bet there are more than one time, but I can point to one time. Well, like, what was it? I said, Cal Poly was a seven. We won in 14 and then we won first round in the NCAA tournament. So, um, and I think we would rather have the play in game than be a 15, to be honest, I'd rather be a 16 than playing in, uh, in Ohio. Anyway, the, the, that's kind of all beside the point. Um, the, the fact that we finally added swimming and diving, I can't quite figure out why we've been so resistant to do that over the years. Um, I think we were pretty close with our prior conference leadership, but for whatever reason, it's taken us a long time to finally get here. Uh, we have six Big West teams plus a couple of affiliates that we can invite along if we want in uh, Pacific and San Diego, University of San Diego. Uh, they'd be great partners for us. We could still have an eight-team swimming and diving league if we wanted to do that. I think that's got to be determined. Uh, but I'm excited for our swimmers and divers because, to be honest, when we do our postseason events like we did uh, last weekend and we're announcing all Big West, all Big Sky, all Pac-12 performers, the swimmers are just kind of sitting there. Yay, good for you guys. I wish we could have something like that. Right. Um, so now they finally will have that opportunity to say they're all academic Big West or I was all Big West or I was even a Big West champion. Because uh, on your resume, when you say you were you were the MPSF champion, it's like, what is, is that like a Division three thing? Like, what is that? Right. Nobody, right. but people know what the Big West is, right? People know what the Big Sky is. So uh, I think that's going to be a huge change for, for really all of our swim programs on the West Coast, it's going to be so, so, so much better. Maybe we can keep some of that California talent at home uh, because now they're going to be competing in what I would call a real, um, real conference oper- uh, opportunities. Um, the, the, I think the other question was the basketball tournaments or the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the baseball tournament. So it's kind of interesting when five teams came up, I was, I admit, I was very skeptical. Like, why would, why would we do that? But is unanimous by the coaches. They have done a huge deep dive on the success of the teams in our conference. And they felt like the line to draw the postseason was at five, not at four. Um, so we honestly, we acquiesced and said, you guys have done the research. You know this better than we do. We're good. They didn't want six. They didn't want four. They all wanted five. For softball, I believe it's six that are going to go. Um, that's, you know, again, a little bit interesting. I, I still like the concept of protecting the higher seeds. I always have. Um, I don't like the fact that teams will have to stay home in some of these sports, but I think it's okay because we still want to protect the higher seeds. So let's be honest, the year we were the seventh seed in in men's basketball uh, and went, that may not have been what was best for the conference. You know, um, we maybe could have got a 13 seed that year out of it instead of us going as a 16. Well, we got the tournament win. So I think we it wound up being okay for us, but I think as a conference, you got to look at it beyond your own selfish uh, for us, green interests or for others, whatever their colors are looking at things through those colored glasses. I think we got to look at things as what's best for the conference. And for me, what's best for the conference is making sure, <coughs> excuse me, our best team gets to go. And then we get as many bids after that. And uh, and in some of these sports, we've been one bid, unfortunately. I don't see that changing in men, men's and women's basketball, but certainly in sports like softball, baseball, soccer, we should be multi-bid leagues, and we think we can do that. 
Hey, I always got to ask you about facilities uh, when we catch up on this platform. I, I know the Madden Center broke ground uh, at the start of the spring game in late April. Uh, I'm really excited. Uh, I've seen some of the, the renderings of this new tennis facility uh, that's on the way. B beyond those, and it, I mean, feel free to give updates on, on those as you will, but uh, w what other facilities are, are being talked about that, that you can publicly kind of talk about and tell the fan base about? Yeah, well, there's 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 always something being built. So uh, I would say most of the other things are are uh, backstage issues, like our locker room. So our women's soccer team is going to undergo. Uh, they were the 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 very last team that did a renovation when I got here. So now it's been a you know 13 years since they've had an update. So it's time. So they're going to get a brand new locker room. Um, you know, the space is the same. So they're going to get a renovated locker room uh, right after their season. Uh, we got two or three others like that that are going to be internal. So men's soccer, they're working on theirs as well. That was due to the flooding uh, that we had in the spring. And I don't think a lot of people knew that, that our spaces in Spano Stadium got pretty well flooded uh, this, this spring and a lot of damage was done. So we've, we're have we pretty much having to start over. And, uh, of course, the university says, well, we're self-insured, which we all know what that means. It means you're not. And you got to find the money. So sure. self-insured meant we had to go out and, and try to scrape together some pennies to figure out how we can make that thing uh, work. The tennis building, the Comfort Pavilion is going to be one of the best in California, certainly the best in the Big West. Um, and of course, the Madden Center, um, you know, it's it has gone through 20 design changes. We're still working on it. Um, the site has a lot of issues with where we're going to build it. So we're trying to work through some of those. Of course, it seems like every tube, pipe, or wire on this campus goes underneath that construction site. So the whole campus drains underneath that um, where this facility is going to be. So we're having to get, spend quite a bit to move and relocate uh, a lot of different, you know, sewers and drains and waters, uh, uh, water, steam, you name it. It's it's underneath that sucker. Um, so that's, that's taken us some time to kind of sort through, but that'll start very, very soon. I would say the thing that the, the fans would want to get a little bit more excited about is what we're doing to the North end zone. So obviously the South end zone is going to be completely shut down. You'll see cranes down there all season long working. Uh, but on the North side, we're putting in a, a new video display. So the scoreboard as it sits now was pretty big, but the video component of it was, was it wasn't uh, all that big. The video component on this one will be bigger than the entire area of the existing scoreboard, and that will be in place certainly for our first football game, hoping for our first soccer match in August. Um, and then we've got designs of um, – I, I, I struggle to come up with a better term other than a beer garden uh, that would be around that on the north side where you've got your tiers. And uh, we're currently pitching that to a few people to help us with uh, some sponsorship. Uh, we think it would be a worthwhile enterprise for concerts and other other things that are in there besides football and soccer that uh, could hopefully generate some revenue uh, for Cal Poly Corporation and for athletics. But it, it's pretty exciting. It's a lot of fun to look at that kind of stuff. And it's it's trying to enhance the social engagements of being at a football game or a soccer match. And I think you see the the NFL franchises are doing that. You see it in more and more college venues. The brand new venues that they're being built have a lot more patio, what they're calling patios and gardens and decks and other things where it's not just go to your seat and watch the game. It's a lot more of a social um, atmosphere. And I think that's something that we can do down at Spanos. Uh, is it Spanos still? Is it Spano yeah. So it, yeah. So it's still, it's always, it's always going to be Spanos stadium. Um, what, what you may, what you're referring to is the field naming. So one of the other really great things we're able to do in furthering our partnership with Dignity Health here in town, um, we were able to, to put their name on the field. And in doing so, it is uh, Mustang Memorial Field presented by Dignity Health. So in all things, you're probably going to see that a little bit more. I think we want to celebrate Mustang Memorial Field a little bit more than obviously the sponsorship. Um, so you may see that referred to just a little bit more than, than we have in the past. And I think that's okay. I don't think it detracts from uh, the Spanos naming at all. Uh, but I do think it's a strategy we can employ to make that partnership with Dignity uh, even more valuable and more beneficial for our students.
Okay. So by the time, you know, September 2nd rolls around and, and I, I introduce the broadcast, the season opening football game against San Diego, I got to make sure that I, I get all that in. Uh, mentioning football, uh, you got six home games this year. You got a first year head coach, Paul Wolf, big transfer portal pickups that have brought a lot of attention and a lot of buzz to this program. I know that you were you were very high on what you saw early last year before some injuries came into play and, and maybe forced some guys that weren't ready into action against just the gauntlet of, of a big sky conference. But is it realistic to think that the ceiling of this 2023 team could get back to the FCS playoffs? Um, I, I, I think we would have to have a lot of luck along the way for something like that to happen. What I, what I do believe we are going to see is tremendous progress. I think people are going to see a football team that's bigger, stronger, faster than what they've seen the last two years. Um, the recruiting has been uh, really, really, has gone really well. Uh, but more, more importantly, I would say our development has gone really well. So we've been able to invest in, in meals, protein, um, for our football team in ways that we have not done so during the rest of my tenure here. Um, and I, I give Jackson uh, Stava on our staff a huge amount of credit along with Coach Wolf for figuring out a way to partner with some of our local community restaurants and businesses um, to give us uh, not free, but certainly uh, at a very reasonable rate, um, extra meals for these guys so they can go to a Taco Temple, a Charlie's Place, um, Milestone, Firestone, whatever those, you know, wherever they want to go. Old Slow Barbecue is another one where they can get, they can order one of maybe two or three, four things off of the menu that is geared towards them, especially made for them and picture a, a big giant burrito with a, with fewer rice, a lot more beans, a lot more meat, a lot higher protein. So these guys can actually um, put on some, some muscle mass that we need. Uh, and the, the average on our team has been uh, the last number I saw was a 13 pound weight gain per man, just as spring alone. Now, everybody's not gaining 13 pounds. Some guys put on 20. And we're hoping that's our linemen and not our receivers, but you get my <laughs> point because uh, some of the guys don't really need to put on weight. Sure. So those guys that really do need to put it on, they're putting on more than 13. And uh, I think that's where we've, we've fallen behind our peer group is how we've developed and grown our offensive and defensive linemen um, to be, you know, division one competitors. We've been undersized with the triple option for a long time. We're, we're still working our way out of that. And now we need to be big, strong lineman like the rest of the big sky has. And uh, I'd say we're on our way. So I'm, I'm super pumped to see what they do. Uh, you mentioned the transfers. We've had a few coming in. Our starting quarterback from a year ago that started the first two games is healthy again or will be healthy again. He's still got a little bit of rehab to do, but come fall, he's going to be good to go. Uh, so I think there's going to be a very healthy, healthy competition at quarterback as well as quite a few other positions. And competition makes everybody better. So I think we got to embrace the fact that that's uh, that's going to be going on and, and we'll see what we got. And then our depth, I think, is something that's gotten a lot better. So you saw us last year with just a couple injuries decimating our roster. And I, I, th I don't think people think about what an injury does. So big deal. You're out your, you know, your your left offensive guard. Well, that means, you know, we may move, move uh, one of our tackles into that spot, bring somebody off the bench to play tackle. We shifted guys from the left side to the right side, and before too long, with just one injury, you got three people playing in a place they sh shouldn't be playing. Uh, and on top of that, you've got somebody playing before they're physically ready. So we had to put some freshmen in now that they've changed the red shirt rules, or there really isn't a red shirt rule. Um, we can play those freshmen in some games, and and we kind of got stuck putting some guys in some games when we know you're not ready. You're you need a year in the weight room and a year of of eating you know, high calorie meals, with a lot of protein, and you're just not ready to play. And that puts that person in a bad position. So the depth is certainly going to help us uh, get through the season a whole lot better because those injuries are going to come. Well, certainly it'll help to have six of the 11 games right here in San Luis Obispo. And a lot of early games, I noticed. Uh, three home games in September, another two in October, just one in November. But uh, for this team to kind of get comfortable, probably better to have more games at home early uh, then be forced to go out there on the road and, and play a bunch uh, early in the season away from the Central Coast. One FBS game 
at San Jose State. Eh, never know. Uh, Cal Poly's had a good history with uh, going to Mountain West schools in football and uh, giving them a tough time. Very good stuff as always. Don Oberhelman, Cal Poly Director of Athletics, our guest. Hey, enjoy the summer. This is a great place to be always, but especially this time of year. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate your time today. Thanks. This has been the Mustang Insider Show. The preceding has been a Learfield presentation on the Cal Poly Sports Network.